So when they took the tube out and the machine's not breathing for me, all of a sudden I'm not breathing anymore. And I tried the new age stuff. I tried the witchcraft, the tarot cards, all of that. She would grab my wrist and tell me exactly how she wanted me to myself and tell me just yourself already you're already gonna go to hell you're oh such gosh. an abomination to this family they call it spirits for a reason yeah, yeah. it was demonic it was a demon that yeah. knew the plan that god had for my life she was in jail mm -hmm. for hit and run and abusing you and she's like i don't know how this is physically possible like your cervix looks literally brand new she's an atheist bruce lawn all right friends i'm here with a new friend of mine lex rennick she is an incredible person with a powerful story of there's a whole lot, okay? So we're, we're going to jump in. Uh, Lex, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Um, you grew up partly in Big Bear, California. Yes. Right? And we go to Big Bear for the snow because people don't, man, most people don't know, Southern California doesn't have seasons. Yeah. So we got to drive <laughs> three hours to get any sort of season. And I, I love Big Bear. You just drove down mm -hmm. from Big Bear with your with your husband and your baby that I got to meet. Um, tell me, let's start at the beginning. Like, what was, what was it growing up? In, in Big Bear. Like, cause you know, when you go travel someplace and you always yeah. be like, what would it be like to live here? Right. Yeah. Me and my wife always play that game. What would it be like to live in Big Bear? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like to live in Big Bear and grow up in Big Bear? I think so. I, I grew up there when I was a junior in high school. Okay. Um, I think when you're there as a teenager, you kind of take things for granted mm. <laughs> because now that we've left and we, we've been able to come back, we've realized how special and how lucky, you know, we were to grow up up there and go snowboarding and have snow days. And, you know, it's, it was really cool to do that. And we have a lot of family up there, too. Um, but I just feel like maybe we might have taken it a little for granted yeah. you know, before. What yeah. what was it like a small town feel? Definitely. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows your business vibes. Definitely. Everyone's dating everyone. Mm. It was like they were still playing hacky sack. Mm -hmm. No one was really on their phones yet. It, it takes an extra three to five years for trends to hit Big Bear, mm. like when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I definitely got that, that, that vibe in yeah. terms of just being in the city. So did you graduate mm -hmm. from high school there? I did. Okay. Yeah. What, what year did you graduate? graduate 2015. Graduate? 2015. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you graduate high school and then do you do you stick around Big Bear and, and kind of like immerse yourself in that community or do you graduate no. and bounce? I graduated and my dad's like, okay, you have one or two options. Go to college or join the military. Really? And yeah, and I grew up in like a law enforcement military background with my family. Okay. And my family has always been like, if you want to follow your dream, why not serve your country? Because there's people that have died for you to have, you know, the ability to go and live out your dream. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So I went to the recruiter office and he's like, well, what do you like to do? And I'm like, I'm at church like five days a week. I don't really think <laughs> you, you have anything for that. Yeah. He's like, actually, we have a chaplain, chaplain's assistant position. Okay. And so I signed a contract with the U.S. Army to do that. And so basically um, the Army, all the branches of the military have a chaplain corps. So you can be Protestant, Buddhist. Um, you're basically providing religious support for the soldiers mm -hmm. or for military personnel. But if you're a chaplain, which is an officer, um, they take a vow that thou shall not kill. So they've created my MOS to bear arms to protect them while they provide religious support. Mm. So kind of a little bit of a bad ASS job, you know? <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So, so how many years did you spend? In Three the years. Army? Three years in the Army? Three years, yeah. Wow. And it really got my foot in the door of like loving the lost and really desiring to be in ministry. Mm -hmm. And at the time, since I was identifying as Austin, I was the first ever openly serving transgender religious affairs specialist in the entire United States Army. Whoa. The first recognized. Whoa. Yeah. So it was it was a big deal. My my Baptist chaplain wasn't expecting to have a transgender protect him yeah. <laughs> while he provided religious support, but yeah. we're still great friends and had a lot of good conversation on the journey. Wow. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you for serving our yeah, country in absolutely. that way and protecting the chaplain. Did you did you deploy and do anything no. overseas, just local stuff? No, um, we were supposed to deploy, and then, of course, our orders got pulled. Yep. Um, and I was really bummed about that because right when I got out, our unit left. Like, mm. they left with a new chaplain assistant. I'm like, dang, I've known these guys for three years. Mm. Um, but, you know, God had other plans. So. And where were you stationed during all that? I was actually here in Riverside. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. so at March Air Force Base. Way cool. Yeah, yeah okay. so I don't have to go that far. So you mentioned while you were in the military, you are you were identifying as mm -hmm. Austin. Yes. Uh, Austin was who you went by when you were mm -hmm. identifying as a male or, yes. or man. Um, when did the 
like I guess feelings of gender dysphoria start mm -hmm. for you? Is when you were a kid? Yeah. Was it when you were an adult? And how'd that go? Yeah, this is before it was really like indoctrinated or in schools and stuff, um, or all over the media. This is when I was five or six years old, mm. you know, dealing with this. And I'm 27 now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, long story short, the first thoughts came in after there was divorce within my family. So I actually grew up in a Christian family. My parents were in ministry. So we were at church three to five days a week, but little did people know that behind closed doors, there's a lot of hidden trauma. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of secret sin. There's mm -hmm. an alcohol addiction mixed with pills with my family. And so unfortunately there was adultery that happened. Mm -hmm. And my father being my spiritual protector was removed from the home. And it's like the enemy knew this is the perfect time to open Pandora's box mm -hmm. and have all this confusion come in. So my innocence was ripped away at that very young age of, of mm. six years old. Mm. Um, and once that happened, it's like abusers know when kids are being abused. So mm. that was just once of the many, mm. unfortunately. Um, and just from there, like as a kid, I, we had a pool. I'd take off my shirt just with the other guys and mm -hmm. jump in. And mm -hmm. my mom would be like, what are you doing, hon? Mm -hmm. Like, you're a girl, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I would be so confused. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm a boy. Mm -hmm. So it was always this confusion that I had from a very young age of understanding gender. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Your mom then moved to Marietta. Am yes. I tracking correctly? Yes. So she's in Marietta, which is, I mean, that's 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 right up the street from us. It's about 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Actually, probably about 30 minutes away from where we're at. And so you're growing up, you're just doing normal stuff. At what point does that that, that moment happened at the pool. Do you remember how old you were when that happened? Probably around the same age, six, seven okay. years old. So very, very young. Okay. And like my my parents both really want me to like emphasize that, that mm -hmm. this wasn't just some fad, like I wasn't like a trans trender. Mm -hmm. Like it was something that they struggled with watching me struggle with mm -hmm. it. So, yeah. Wow. So the, the, the feeling comes mm -hmm. before the SA that you experienced or after the SA? After. After, okay, mm -hmm. so there's some essay that happens, which is code for those of you guys that you yeah. know, you're smart enough. The essay that happens, and then the feelings of, I don't, I don't feel, was it like that logical? Like, uh, I don't feel comfortable in my own body. I don't feel yeah. like I'm in the right body. It was literally that, that it, thought. It literally was like, why do I have female parts when I'm a boy? Mm -hmm. It wasn't a question of like, oh, maybe this. No, it was just like, I remember when Google came out and I had the first iPod touch, I, I Googled like, I, I'm a born female, mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm a boy trapped in a woman's body. And when I typed that, the word transgender came up and it was like this big moment of relief for me mm -hmm. because when you're a kid and you have some weird things going on, mm -hmm. you think you're the only one. Mm -hmm. And so for me, there was this bit of relief of like, okay, this word trans transgender, like I'm not the only person going through this. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a big relief for me at the time. And what year was this? Um, I'm not sure the year, but I'm going to guess around 11 or 12 years old. Okay. Yeah, so right before puberty hit, because once puberty hit, that's when, like, the dysphoria came on, and, like, dysphoria is basically... So there's a difference between body dysmorphia and dysphoria. Okay, what's the so, difference? So um, with trans people, they, they identify dysphoria almost being like, you want to unzip yourself. It's almost like you, you literally want to unzip yourself, open your skin up, and walk out, because you're so uncomfortable. Like, I couldn't focus on my dreams my desires for the future, relationships. I couldn't focus on anything because I was mm. so focused on my identity mm. and like being uncomfortable. Every day it was a struggle. And when I was 13 years old going through puberty and, you know, my breasts started to form and I started having a period, it became so depressing to the point where I would duct tape my chest for mm. 10 hours a day because I was so uncomfortable with, with my breast growing. Mm. And no one just does that for fun. You know, mm. no one knew that I was doing that. My stepdad would be like, where did all my duct tape go in the garage? Mm. Meanwhile, I'd be in the bathroom at the end of the day peeling it off. Mm. And as I'd peel it off, my skin would come off with it. So <sighs> I was never able to wear white t-shirts because I would bleed through my shirts. Oh gosh! And this was before like binders came out, you know, that people would wear to flatten their chest. Mm. And there was just this heavy uncomfortability, such a lie from the enemy that like I needed to do all these things to finally be free. And so that's when I learned about like the hormones and the surgeries and all the things that tell you if you do these things, you'll finally feel free. Mm. Now, you ended up having a surgery at one I point. I did. Um, but before we get into that, I'm assuming you you did some hormones initially. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And how old were you when you started hormones? 18. 18. So I, I was on hormones for seven years, 14 years I identified as a man, 14 years of, um, of identifying, I mean, as, as soon as middle school, high school age, 
I was using the boys' restroom, all of that, and none of this was notified to my parents. Whoa. No one knew any of this. And this is... This, this is, is before it's like even in schools. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're... Are you telling a different name? Are you telling your teachers to call you a different name? The crazy thing about my testimony, too, is when I was in my mom's belly when she was pregnant with me, they told my parents that I was supposed to be born a boy. Hmm. And so when I had this confusion as a very young kid, my mom would always say, like, did you tell her? Did mm. you tell her that she was actually supposed to be born a boy? Because mm. that's what they told my family, every ultrasound, to the point where I had blue Nikes in a blue room. Like, my aunt had to go oh. and figure out, you know, how to change the paint in the room and yeah. stuff once I was born. Yep. So that's how I chose the name Austin, because I was originally supposed to be named Austin Mira. Whoa. And then I was a no-name for about 48 hours, and they ch changed Austin to Alexis. Uh -huh. So... Wow. Pretty wild. So 14 years, you identify mm -hmm. as a man. Mm -hmm. Half of those years from the age of 18 onward, you took testosterone. Ju testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like the moment? Because at 18, you start to get testosterone. And so if I'm doing the math correctly, it's 2018-ish, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So what was that like when you when, when, when the, you, you start actually getting hormone therapy? Yeah, I wanted to start earlier. Like I wanted to start when I was 15, 16 years old, but my parents are like, no, this is a decision that like we don't necessarily agree with. And we just believe that this is a decision an, an adult should make. Mm -hmm. So at 18, you can make that decision. Mm -hmm. Very grateful. I'm so grateful because what if I would ne ever be able to have a child, mm -hmm. you know, um, starting at a younger age. So at 18, when I started, I went to Planned Parenthood and they willy nilly nowadays just write you a prescription. You can walk out with the testosterone, with the needles that day. Well, at my time frame, it was just when everything came out. So you had to be in, in gender therapy with a therapist for a certain amount of time before they could approve you to do this. Because mm -hmm. this is life altering things, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, once you start taking testosterone, they really say you, you most of the time cannot go back. These mm -hmm. are long term decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. So I started going to gender therapy, uh, got the letter from my gender therapist saying like, OK, like you're mentally stable enough to take testosterone. Mm -hmm. And once I started testosterone, it was this bit of relief because I felt like finally I, my body was going to match my mind. Mm. And it, it's the narrative that the world sells. You know, you do these things, you know, finally be free. Um, and so I started injecting myself every Wednesday with a needle about this big, mm. taking testosterone. And immediately I grew my Adam's apple um, within three months. Mm. So and that was probably one of the most painful things that happened during that that time. Like like physically painful? Yeah, physically painful when I grew it. Yeah. Really? And I was on a very high dose of testosterone as well. Uh -huh. um, I started at 0.5 milligrams a week. So that, it was a very a high lot. dosage. Yeah, most people start at 0.1. Why did they give you so much? Or point, I have no idea. <laughs> My endocrinologist had no idea what she was doing. So... And this is this so, so all things considering this is still relatively early around yes. this conversation because this stuff's yes. kind of, I feel like has gone more and more mainstream in the last like pandemic, post pandemic mm -hmm. vibes. And you're so, but you're you're going through this. You said you graduated high school in 2015. Yes. So this is like 2015, 2018. You're you're experiencing all this. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna ask you a question, and I'm not trying to make light of any of this. Okay. But considering you're on testosterone, mm -hmm. and you were in the military, did you just like get super jacked? <laughs> I was top three in my class <laughs> for physical fitness. Yeah. yeah, I was top three in my class. Um, a amongst everyone, or amongst the women? Amongst everyone. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you had jacked. <laughs> yeah, and and that's that's the thing too. Like, if you're taking testosterone, yeah. Like, uh, here here was the thing with the military. They're like, okay, even if we don't agree, uh -huh. if you're gonna identify as a male, we want you to hit male standard. We want to know that you can actually take care of us. Okay. Especially with my MOS, yeah. like you want to make sure that that they're taken care of. Huh. And so that's how I gain respect. I was working out like crazy, going mm. to the gym, just making sure that I could handle my part of the job. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was this of obviously like this cocky confidence that you get when you're a soldier. <laughs> and I was the smallest one. So they'd be like, they'd be like, go get mirror. We're going to have, we're going to have him shoot the 50 cal, you yeah. know, at the time. Cause yeah. I'm the smallest one in the unit. So what, what, what do you remember like the physical requirements? Cause it, cause to be in the military, you have to do like a certain number of pull-ups pull and a certain number of pushups. Do you remember what those were? I can't remember, but I'm sure you can look it up now. Yeah. Like I, I know it's different now, but, yeah. um, yeah. So you were crushing it. <laughs> yeah. I was doing really good. Outside of the Adam's apple and outside of just, mm -hmm clearly like you're you're more physically capable yeah of i mean you're top three that's a big deal 
What were the were there changes to mood? Were there changes to Absolutely. other things? What was that like? I would say that that would be the first thing that happens with hormones because hormones have a lot to do with your mental health. I felt like a lot of my dysphoria, dysphoria went away because mm. I became more masculine. Mm. Women are naturally crazy. I can say that now, <laughs> you know, because I would take this, take these testosterone injections and literally be so chill. Like the world could be falling apart. And I'm like, yeah, I'd be all right. Like, no worries. Wasn't stressed out. Wasn't worried. I had a lot more energy, but it was also like going through puberty all over again, mm. like high sex drive, um, eating a lot. Uh, all of that really changed. My whole body structure changed. Mm. It went from, you know, more of a feminine physique mm. to very straight, you know, uh, up and down my shoulders got broader i mean i just recently saw a friend yesterday and she's like it's crazy like mm -hmm. your body just a few years ago on testosterone to now it doesn't even look like mm -hmm. the same because mm -hmm. i thankfully have gone back mm -hmm. um to my my feminine traits but everything changed my facial structure changed mm -hmm. um even the my forehead i, be I began to get a widow's peak like my dad mm -hmm. so a lot of things changed wow and is it likely that had you started sooner mm -hmm. it would have been more irreversible absolutely yeah i think i think if i would have started maybe even at puberty mm. which nowadays that's what's happening they're putting kids on puberty blockers mm -hmm. etc i think the damage could have and would have been worse um so i'm glad that i started at 18 but i think a lot of the reverse that's happening with the detransition mm -hmm. has been the blessing of have bearing children mm. and having children because now I'm getting an overload of of estrogen. Mm -hmm. So I often get asked the question like, do you have to take estrogen now mm -hmm. to make up for the years of taking testosterone? And I'm like, no, like God's just kind of leveled it all out and mm. the pregnancies have actually helped all my feminine qualities come back, including my voice. Yeah. You, my voice was way deeper than it was now. It's probably never going to go back to what I naturally, you know, yeah. spoke. Yeah. But I just believe, you know, God has the power to do anything. If he wants to remove my Adam's apple, yeah. wants to remove my scars and make my breasts grow back, like yeah. there's nothing too far that like God can't do. Yeah. Um, but he can also say no and mm. use these things for his glory. Amen. So. Amen. Um, before we get into the full restoration that's been happening in your life, which is, which is yeah. incredible, um, you... Talk about when you went in to do the surgery and what led up to that yeah. and what happened in that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I struggled so much with my body, you know, dysphoria. Mm -hmm. It it sucked. I felt like I could never go swimming or I could never go to, like, the beach or do anything Even fun. though you were on testosterone. Even though I was on testosterone. Even though you're jacked at this point yeah. and you're super fit. Yeah, because I still had breasts, uh -huh. you know. Um, I mean, could I maybe pass if I took my shirt off. Yeah. But there's still this personal uncomfortability that I had. Mm. And my family was like, again, we don't agree, but if you're going to do this, go to the best of the best. Don't get a botched surgery. Mm -hmm. So I went to the guy that invented top surgery, top surgery mm. in Florida and, uh, they don't take insurance. Like you have to pay cash. And mm. so I paid $10,000 cash for my surgery. Jeez. And it wasn't like I put it on a credit card. Like yeah. I paid cash for this. Yeah. And as I went in, um, the average amount of like length of the surgery is anywhere from like four to eight hours. Mm. But because this guy invented the surgery, he literally does three to five a day. So he can get this done within two hours a person. Mm -hmm. I was in there for the length of almost 10 hours in this surgery. Mm. It was during COVID. And so my husband had COVID. He couldn't fly out with me. So I had my stepmom there. Now, now everyone's kind of freaking out like what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they actually, the hospital told the surgeon to leave the building because he's done so many surgeries, never had a death on his record, and they thought that I would be the first. Mm. So they said that the surgery went great, it went well, but the minute that they extubated me, I no longer wanted to breathe. What is ex excavated? So um, they intubate you when they put the tube okay, down. Okay, when they take in the tube out. Yeah, so when mm -hmm. they took the tube out and the machine's not breathing for me, all of a sudden I'm not breathing anymore. Mm. And so I woke up coughing up blood. I had, was connected to all these machines. I'm all like doped up, you know, on, on these pain meds. And it was scary. I had no idea what was happening. They, they told me, we don't think you're ever going to have the ability to fully breathe again. Um, they, they're like, we had to tell the surgeon to leave because we were afraid that you were going to lose your life. Mm. And I'm like, first of all, that's a red flag. How many other people has this happened to, you know, and they just told him to leave. Um, but basically they gave me this device where you like suck into it to see your lung capacity. It has like three balls in it that goes up and down. I thought they were joking with me because I was trying as hard as I could to like blow into this thing. 
not one of them was moving. Mm. And that's when I'm like, oh man, this is like actually serious. And so I was just praying and repenting like, God, like, please, like, please let me have my full lung, you know, capacity back and everything. Thankfully it did come back. Um, but it was a surgery that I knew that I was going to threaten my like life mm. to finally feel comfortable. And I'm not going to lie at the time, like once I healed up and I went to the beach and went on my honeymoon and all these things. Yeah. I felt a lot more confident than I ever, ever imagined. But never in my life did I ever imagine I could honestly say now that I absolutely regret getting top surgery. Sounds like you almost died. Yeah, I did. Wow. And you said average surgery for this doctor is two hours. Yes. Yours went almost 10 hours. Mm -hmm. when, I mean, clearly there's there's sounds like there's something happening in the spiritual because you, you've kind of always maintained a, a connection with the Lord yeah. throughout this entire process. When you woke up, what, what what did they explain went wrong? Like if the, if he does if he does two or three a day and it's like mm -hmm. hey get out of here because you might have a death on your record and they're thinking you could die. Yeah, they they by the way they still won't even give me my medical records and that's my legal right to get them. So I'm gonna have to even reach out and get a lawyer to get my medical records. Really? Because I need to know what they gave me. If I get in a car accident, what if it was just a bad reaction in the anesthesia? Or you know honestly, it could have been spiritual as well. Mm -hmm. I need to know what I was given that way. If anything happens, my husband knows like, Hey, if there's a car accident, like she can't have this or don't give her that. So it's, it's really scary. I've been trying for over two years now to get those medical records. And what do they say when you ask? They keep ignoring me. They'll hang up the phone on me. They'll say no one's in. I'm like, I've sent emails. I've texted. Like I need this information. I've even called the actual surgeon himself. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So I don't know if it's because you know, my testimony's out there. I don't know if they think that I'm trying to sue. It's literally not that. I just want to know, mm -hmm. you know, what I was given so I have that. Mm. Yeah, I have that information. Wow. That's crazy. So the, the, the top surgery came after you were already married. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to tell me how did, how did that yeah. come about? Because I got to meet your husband yes. and, and your baby which uh, amazing, beautiful Thank family. You. Um, so, okay, so walk me through that because he shared some of his story on Michael Knowles' channel. Yes. Um, and he thought he was dating a man because mm -hmm. he identified as gay at the time. Yes. And you're like, no, but I have woman parts. <laughs> yeah. So walk me through that. Yes. So I, prior to me meeting my husband... Uh, that's why I was just telling you before we filmed, like it was so special being in Big Bear because I had so many falling on my face moments with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I had this special doc that, that I would go to to just cry out to God, pray, just laugh with God. Um, and I would, I went to this doc and I would go there daily, mm -hmm. like even during work or whatever. And I went to this doc this one time, maybe about a week before I met my husband. And it was different. Like something about this moment was different. Like I knew I was going to encounter God. I knew I was going to lay something at his feet. I walk to the end of this talk and I fall on my knees and I just say, Lord, I know you now mm. because I was born again at 17. I rededicated my life at 17 after three suicide attempts, just super depressed. Mm. This girl from high school kept inviting me to a youth group, finally said yes. I went and like they were taking off their shoes and it wasn't even Pentecostal. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. what's going on? And I'm like, why are they taking their shoes off? And she's like, well, what do you do when you get home? And I'm like, well... I take my shoes off. And she's like, well, welcome home. Mm -hmm. And it was so prophetic to me. And this is in Big Bear? This, no, this is actually Marietta in before Marietta. I was a junior in high school. Okay. And so I see these kids just really going after the Lord. And I tried the new age stuff. I tried the witchcraft, the tarot cards, all of that. Got nothing from it. I was really angry at God through everything that I went through. Uh -huh. And I think I, I grew up knowing of Jesus, not having a true authentic relationship with him. Mm -hmm. I just saw a lot of religion in my family. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I saw these kids really going after the Lord and I'm like, you know what? I don't know what they have, but I know that I want it. Mm. Um, and so I read it, rededicated my life at 17. So back to this doc moment, I'm like, God, I've been walking with you since I'm 17. It, d despite the feelings mm -hmm. of th dysphoria. Yes. I'm saying the right word correctly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Despite the feelings of dysphoria, despite, um, struggling in multiple ways, attempting to take your own life. Yeah you still have this encounter with Jesus. Yes, absolutely. And you're like, hey, like I'm walking with you. And and, and is it kind of like, you, from your standpoint, we'll sort this stuff out later in mm -hmm. terms of gender identity, in terms of these things like- I bought into the lie of okay. like, God made me this way. God, okay, so so you're like, I'm, in, I'm, I'm team Jesus, yeah. but Jesus made me this way. Yeah, I okay. was really bought into that deception mm -hmm. and that lie. Mm -hmm. 
But on that journey of being 17, like God was still removing things. God doesn't say, you know, come into my, uh, invite me in and then get it all cleaned up. Mm -hmm, He's like, mm -hmm. no, come in now. Yeah, yeah, uh, but God loves us enough to not let us stay as we are. He Amen. wants the best and the fullest for us. So God removed like years of a hidden porn addiction that no one knew about. Mm -hmm. I was like really drowning myself in alcohol and just smoking and different drugs mm -hmm. to try and drown out the pain that I was looking to try and heal with mm -hmm. my, the world's ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like God wasn't removing things. It's like, the Lord wants to bless us and heal us from things, but we have to let go. Mm. We have to be ready to release that to him. Mm -hmm. And so I, I walk to the end of the stock and I'm like, Lord, I know you now. I don't want to hear it from some guy holding up a sign saying, I'm going to hell. I know you. Mm -hmm. So God, if, if me identifying, um, at the time I was only dating women. Mm. So I'm like, if me dating a woman, I wasn't ready to lay down my identity because again, I bought into the lie, mm -hmm. but I, I kept having this conviction about my sexuality. I was only sleeping with women, only dating women. I'm like, God, you have the power to change me. I love the gospel of John. I love seeing the miracles of Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, I know you have the power to change me. So if this life that I'm living is not glorifying unto you, it is not your will, then, then change me. Like make me sexually attracted to a man, emotionally, physically, all the things like you have the power to do that. Now, when I said this, knowing I went through a bunch of sexual trauma, this was hard. I can never imagine myself ever feeling like I could trust myself with a man. But I was just like, God, take away my desire for whatever you have, you know, for your desires upon my life. And I remember crying and just laying on my face, just weeping. And I got up and I just pointed at the sky and I'm like, God, you promised to wow me. Mm. Because at one, one point when I was 17, the Lord said, you know, one day I'm really going to wow you. I said, God, radically, like, where's my wow? <laughs> where's my wow? Radically change me. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, a week later, I walk into a coffee shop and the love of my life walks in who happens to be a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, from there, um, crazy thing, he graduated high school, moved to Kauai mm -hmm. and was totally into the new age hippie thing. He grew up Lutheran, so he grew up with a lot of religion, not relationship. And he went and did his own thing, you know, smoking weed on, on a weed farm in Hawaii, doing his own thing. And, and he just felt the Lord drawing him back home to Big Bear. And so he walks in and he's like, I don't know why I'm in here. I know the coffee shop's closing, but like the spirit led me here to just play the piano. And I'm like, oh, the spirit, why don't you sit down so we could talk about the Holy Spirit? Mm. And so our first time that we encountered each other, we were actually talking about like the gift of tongues and just like having our own private you conversation went, with God. Like, we just went deep. <laughs> you know? yeah. I actually think I know the coffee shop. There's a coffee shop with a piano in it. In yeah, Moonridge Coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What a trip. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So at this point, okay, so forgive me if I'm not. No, you're good. But, so at this point, are you identifying as a lesbian, or are you identifying as a man, a heterosexual man? I was identifying as that. Yeah, heterosexual Heterosexual man. man. Yeah. You meet your husband, and then so then you go from heterosexual man to gay man. Yeah. In, from your paradigm. In, in, in that. And he term, also yeah. I, was gay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And But you guys are both raised Christian. You guys both dabbled mm -hmm. into the new age and the witchcraft and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And then you meet each other. And you guys are a gay couple? Yeah, there's just, just undeniable attraction. And we, yeah, from the outside, definitely. That's, but that's how you guys mm -hmm. are, are, are presenting yourselves yeah. to the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, so then what was that relationship like? And, and, how, mm -hmm. and how did the Lord... Because what I love about your story, Lex, mm -hmm. is that despite all of this, despite the attempts at deletion, despite buying into some of the deception of the enemy, despite mm -hmm. uh, your struggles, despite the essay... There's still a centerness on the Lord. Yes. And 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 it's not all done overnight. It's not like you get mm -hmm. saved and everything happens. God's kind of working on you, revealing himself to you. You're wrestling. Yeah. And and it seems like even your husband is like Lutheran background, kind of wild out with mm -hmm. some of the weed farm stuff in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. And and here's the Lord seemingly bringing you guys together. Yes. Right? And now you have this beautiful family. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm so intrigued by all of that because I think it's so interesting because again, from our paradigm as Christians, like my pastor said, we have, we are a microwave people mm. who serve a crock pot God. Mm, and we wow. want these like instant, like, all right, so boom, it's off, it's done. It's right. But that just, that wasn't your guys' journey. No. It seemed like it was it was longer. So tell me that. So now you guys meet. So what was, and what year is this approximately? Oh, gosh. Um, 
I don't know the year. Because you guys have been married four years. Yeah, I'm sorry. My husband's my brain. Okay, it's all right. Um, so I'm going to guess like... 2020 because we've been okay. married for four years. We got May, married May 30th. So we were only together for three months, got engaged. Okay. I proposed. So like right around the pandemic time. Doc. Yeah, I proposed yeah. the day of the lockdown. Yeah, it was the day of the lockdown. Okay. I okay. remember my barber was cutting my hair. I'm like, dude, I'm about to propose to my boyfriend. <laughs> like, do you think wow. that this is like a bad idea? He's like, no, dude, like the world's ending. So yeah. this would be the perfect time <laughs> to like confess your love. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so around the pandemic, you guys meet, um, you, pr- you propose. Yes. What was that like? Um, well, I was more scared to talk to his parents and, okay. and to talk to my you, dad. And you go and ask yeah. for his hand in marriage. I do. I do. Well, yeah, well, okay, you gotta yeah. tell me about that. <laughs> so when I showed it to his parents' house, they were kind of like, what's going on? I'm like, okay, I know that we've only been together for three months. Mm-hmm. And like prior to this, I told my dad, like, I'm really planning on getting engaged. And my dad's like, there's no time limit on love. Like, if you know that this is your person, mm-hmm. then why not? Mm-hmm. You know, like, mm-hmm. just go for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I have his parents sitting across the couch from me now at his house. Mm-hmm. His cat sitting on my lap and petting his cat. I don't like cats. (laughs) The cat bites me while I'm asking, like, in the middle of the sentence, Uh you know, for his hand in marriage. Uh And his parents were like, well, yeah, of course. Like, it was just, it was was kind of awkward, you know. But they didn't know that So this is when I dropped the bomb. Okay, okay. So on our first actual date, Nick and I's first actual date, Mm -hmm. my dad's like, you have to tell him. If you ever date anyone, like, you need to tell the person. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I told Nick, um, he was just like, I was like, by the way, I don't know if you know, but like I'm transgender. So I was born, you know, female. I've identified as male for X amount of years. He's like, okay, anyway, so after we go get coffee, I'm going to go take you on a hike. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. Do you know what that word means? He's like, yeah, but I'm not interested in anything but your heart. Mm. And my husband, like, I'm the only relationship that he's ever had. He pursued people lessfully, like he pursued men lessfully. Um, but he's never pursued anyone in mm. a loving way. Mm. And same with me. I pursued, you know, women lustfully. I've never had a pure relationship. Mm. So I knew if I was going to ask for his hand in marriage, I needed to be honest with his parents. I wanted them to know all of who I was and not just, you know, this face that they see. And so when I told them, they were just kind of like shocked. They even tell me, you know, I wish you would have gave us a day to like swallow the first engagement. <laughs> then the <laughs> trans thing, then you throw the trans thing in there. And, uh, and I was like, but I can give you grandbabies maybe like if that's possible, mm-hmm. hoping that that would sugarcoat everything. Mm-hmm. And, and they just loved me no matter what. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You, you mentioned this point in your conversation with Michael knows where mm-hmm. there's this tension that Christians should have of like, we, we can accept mm-hmm. someone right where they're at, love them right where they're at yes. without fully, uh, affirming mm-hmm. everything about their worldview and about their self-identification. Yeah. And it sounds like that is th- those are some of the things like indirectly that that kind of the mm-hmm. Lord used to 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 fully have you surrender back to Him. Absolutely, I'm very grateful for the churches that we did find that like loved us. One of them, like Pastor Benny, was actually mm-hmm. our pastor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but before we moved to Tennessee, and I'll never forget when we like actually showed up to Church LV. We saw this guy there, like he had a beard, but he had pink hair and a, like a pink fuzzy purse. And like Pastor Benny and like people at the church would just come up to him and say hi and treat him like a normal person. And I knew like this is where we're supposed to be. Mm. They were so on top of obviously preaching the word of God. Um, But there is this, I guess you could say like inclusion, like we were a part of the community. It wasn't like, hey, you can only come on Sundays, but you can't join small group because I've been told that Mm. I was I was so hungry for Jesus. I was so in need of a savior when I was going through my suicide attempts, like middle school, high school struggling with my gender identity. And I was running to the church, but the church was rejecting me and kicking me out. So I ran to a loving community, the queer community. Mm. So I'm very grateful for Church LV, very grateful for, um, you know, ministers and pastors that are are teaching the body of Christ how to love the lost effectively. Mm -hmm. Because those people that were a part of our journey that truly poured into us, that invited us at, to their table mm-hmm. that were hospitable to us. That's where the seeds were planted. That's where the harvest was planted. Mm-hmm. And so we're very grateful for, you know, those those Christians that did that for us. Yeah. I, and I want to go, I want to come back to that. I want to go deeper in yeah. terms of how can Christians do a better job of, mm-hmm. um, again, we're not affirming, we're not saying everything's right, but we're also um, not excluding and not mm-hmm. avoiding. Yeah. Right. And there's a, there's a tension there. Um so tell me more about you and your husband. You guys are engaged. You're telling his parents like, hey, yeah. <laughs> maybe I could have kids someday, right? 
did, did you at that point did you were, were were did you were you saying that as just maybe to soften yeah. the blow, or were <laughs> yeah. you actually in the back of your mind going, yeah, like this still might be a possibility? It was more of like I'm trying to sugarcoat what I'm saying right now because I could never imagine, you mm -hmm. know, um, actually giving birth, actually mm -hmm. bearing children. That sounded like suicide to me. That mm. sounded like something horrific because I knew that I would have to pause hormones if I wanted to do that. And I couldn't imagine doing that because I was like, I need this to finally feel sane, to finally feel comfortable in my body. But I was so in love with Nick that the possibility was also there. Mm -hmm. The willingness was also there. And Nick always wanted to have kids. He just never knew like how that would have ever been possible. Mm -hmm. And part of his testimony too is like people put him in a box like in high school because he was musically talented, mm -hmm. because he was good at acting, you know, because he wasn't this jock. Everyone's like, well, that means that you happen to be gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he grew up with all females, you know, all his cousins are basically girls, you know, so um they just put him in a box and like, well, that means that you're gay. So it just got to a point where he's like, well, I guess that I, that means that I'm gay. Mm. And so that's when he started partaking in, you know, indulging himself within that. Mm. So you and Nick get married. Mm -hmm. You guys are, from your vantage point, two men. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it seems like they're like the Lord starts doing something and yeah. you walk along this journey of detransitioning, mm -hmm. which I think it's very interesting that stories of detransition aren't embraced and heard, mm. right, as much. Yeah. Like, it's like, people's lived experiences, people's lived experiences, and it's like, well, what about Lex's lived experience, right? Yeah. And from my understanding, the de the detransition, I, I think, this is me in my brain, you could, you could push back if you want, I actually think when I when I'm looking at YouTube and content and niches, yeah. uh, I can kind of call what what's going to happen next. I think the detransition community is going to be huge, absolutely, in a couple of years if YouTube doesn't suppress mm -hmm. these stories. Yeah. Um, but tell me about your story of now you're in a in a in a gay marriage with a man who's gay, and the Lord's still speaking to you. You're still hearing mm -hmm. from God, um, and then you start the process of detransition yes yeah, so art the marriage dynamic was totally different than okay. what it is now okay i was really fighting for the masculine role and so there is this like strife that my husband and i would have because naturally you know he wanted to be the leader he wanted to lead and i would just be like basically saying like you're gonna follow what i'm doing you mm. know and so there was this tension within our marriage not that our marriage wasn't great and wonderful it was absolutely fantastic but when you start to realize, like, so now that we are in the Lord's will, the, the blessing is unreal mm -hmm. than when we were out of God's will. Because we were out of God's will. Because I was trying to take the authority mm. as my husband, that automatically put me, like, and my husband outside of the will of God. Wow. You know, so there's yeah, yeah, this natural tension. The, 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 the ways of God is what keeps us in the will of mm -hmm. God. Yes. And if you are usurping God's ways and God's mm -hmm. order and God's... Um, design for marriage. Yes. You, now you're out of the will of God, and there's that 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 that's going to come with its own consequences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like when we were in this gay marriage, like not only did we deal with that, but I just feel like, you know, within the tension of that, it, it was just difficult. You know, you you could say that, and we would have this. Well, what if? What if? Actually, this isn't right. You know, because we were bringing people to church. We were doing our Bible study at home, you know. Hold on, hold on. You guys are in church. Yes. Identifying as a gay couple. Yes. Bringing people to small group. Yes. Serving? Yes. And this is all at Church LV? No, no, no. This is before, before we church went to church, church LV, yeah. Wow. And and, and yeah. so and so no one sat you guys down and had this, like, crazy conversation? You, you're just... Oh, of course. Like, people did have to... to yeah, okay. like, they, they wouldn't let us be, like, leaders of a small group. We started our own Bible study. Outside, outside of? Outside of. Oh, Yeah, and it was okay. just for, like, the misfits, okay. you know? Because we would have friends a part of the queer community or, or, or friends that were into drugs, and yeah, we'd just yeah. be like, man, Jesus loves you. Want yeah. Come over, have dinner. Yeah. It grew to the point where, like, we outgrew our apartment. We had so many people. Uh -huh. And then when we would drive down from Big Bear, mm -hmm. we'd go to Center Point Church in Marietta, mm -hmm. And we would just flood the seats, mm. you know, with people. And this is yeah. all in Big Bear. You guys are having this, these, yeah. these, these, these Bible studies. Yeah. So this thing, you guys are just just trying to be present mm -hmm. while living as a gay couple. Mm -hmm. And then the th the thought comes, the idea comes of like, oh, maybe this isn't what the Lord wants. It was conviction for sure, mm. because although we weren't like twisting God's word mm -hmm. or anything like that, 
when you are a leader in any type of ministry, people are looking at your life, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and although we weren't saying, hey, it's all good, God's cool with this, and we, even though we weren't telling people that, people were looking at our life and getting permission. When you're in sin, people are looking for permission to continue to sin. And so there was just this conviction. And so my husband and I, in our own private time, would be like, well, I, I mean, it would be me. I'd be like, well, I know technically I'm technically a biological woman and you're technically a man, so technically we're all good. I don't want my salvation or uh, my relationship with Jesus to be on a technicality. <laughs> you know? Technically, uh, yeah. we're man and woman, even though. So you're like, okay, as you're as you're feeling this conviction. Yes. W- what what is the segue mm-hmm. to then going? Okay, I'm not just feeling this conviction. We actually need to get aligned with God's ways. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, so my husband, like, this would happen once a month, and someone brought this out on another podcast. They're like, even though you didn't have a period, because your period stops when you take testosterone. Mm. So I didn't have a period for seven years. Mm. They're like, you you kind of had a period <laughs> as far mm-hmm. as, like, you always having this conviction mm-hmm. about your identity. Mm. And so they're like, once a month, I'd be like, what the heck's going on? Yeah, like, yeah. is this right, God? And so finally, my husband just kept saying, you need to get your answers from the Lord. Mm. Like, because I, I had Bibles all around me. Like, I was YouTubing. Like, you're, But you could find anything on YouTube sure. that says, yeah. Yes and no. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, you need to hear this from God. Like, you need to hear this from God. Mm-hmm. And so um, he got blessed with a great opportunity, you know, starting this coffee company and stuff in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And so we were actually in Indiana and he was working these 10 hour work days. And he's like, hey, the company's paying for you to come out, use this time, make this place a furnace and seek the Lord mm-hmm. with, you know, with pray fast, whatever God's telling you to do. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to obey that. And I'm very grateful for my husband always pointing me to Jesus. Even when we identified as that couple, Mm -hmm. we were still hungry for Jesus. We were still going to church LV. We were a part of the men's group Mm -hmm. at church LV. Like, and I'm so grateful because even though we were identifying as this gay couple, man, like our men's group loved on us. Mm. Although we'd have conversations about what the Bible says, you know, et cetera, they loved on us. And I'm so grateful to say that when we go back there, they love us just the same. Mm. What a great example of the Father's love. Amen. And so my husband and I, um, as we continued to like pursue Jesus, um, this unraveling started to happen. Mm. And so the more and more that we're pursuing Jesus, the more we're willing to lay down. Mm. And I often say this every time I speak, we can't expect people to die for Jesus if they don't know the Jesus that died for them. Oof. It's good. You know, but we're yeah. gatekeeping Jesus by Oof. kicking people out of the church. Oh, you're an addict. Oh, you're struggling with this. It's not just the gender and sexuality thing, right. you know? Right. So we got to keep people within the church because it's not our job to change people. It's mm. our job to bring them into reconciliation with Christ Jesus. It's our job to love people and Amen. tell them the truth. Amen. Well, you have to be ready for the truth to set you free. Yep. You yep. know, and yep. I was ready for the truth. So I fall on my face in this hotel room and I'm like, God, again, back to that doc moment, mm-hmm. a moment of surrender. Mm-hmm. I know you, Lord. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care what anyone says. I even cried out to God and it's like, Lord, if I lose my marriage, that's that's obviously going to suck, but I love you more. Mm. If you tell me to detransition regardless of the testosterone, regardless of the surgeries, like I will obey. And the Lord told me, Austin, do you trust me with this? Mm. I think it's so important to notate that he didn't say Lex. Mm. He said Austin, mm. which is such a reminder that the Lord is like, come as you are, mm-hmm. but I love you enough to not let you stay as you are. Come Something on. so much better for you. Mm-hmm. But I love that he he called me that at the time because it, I I was listening and the Lord reminded me like in this moment, this supernatural moment with the Lord in this hotel room, God was bringing me back to moments where I've laid hands on people, identifying as Austin, obeying him at gas stations, saying like, can I pray over your heart? Can I pray over your head? Casting out depression from people, anxiety, believing that and seeing that happen. He's like, why don't you think that I can't do that for you for your dysphoria? Wow. If you've seen me do wonders like that, how come I can't lay my hand upon you, come on, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and remove this from you? Do you trust me with this? He said, trust me and follow. Think about the disciples, how they would either question or just immediately follow. He said, just follow. And And all of this is just deposited in this kind of moment of prayer. Yes, and I'm writing this down. Like I still have it in my prayer journal. Exactly like verbatim everything I heard from the Lord. And I'm weeping there, like tears on the page, just weeping. Because this is a huge moment of fully surrendering. I've never fully surrendered and been this vulnerable my whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord just said, every fear that you have, I'm going to bless. Well, my number one fear was losing my marriage. Mm -hmm. My husband was attracted to a masculine man. He wasn't attracted. He didn't sign up to have a wife. He didn't sign up to have this family. I didn't know what life was going to be like. And I just knew that I needed to say yes fully to Jesus 
even if that meant losing my marriage. Mm. And so after God speaks this to me, he tells me to boldly go out and share my testimony and to bring his children back home. And my husband comes in. He's just wanting dinner. Like he's exhausted. It's a 10 hour work day and I'm just bawling. And he's like, oh gosh, are you okay? You know, and he realizes that I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. And after I spill my guts out to him and I'm just crying and I just said, here's your free out. You didn't sign up to have a wife. And I just cried and he looked at me and we've always, I've always told him, you know, God was always going to come first, but he really kind of took a step back and realized that I truly meant it in that moment that I was going to choose Jesus and that if he needed to leave the marriage, then I gave him the okay and permission to do so. And I was just weeping because he's the love of my life. Like he's my best friend. He's the only person in the world that fully has known who I am. Um, and I was willing to lay that down at the feet of Jesus. And so my husband's like, I'm believing that if you're saying that you're my wife, then as your husband, that God will speak to me. So he's like, I'm not leaving you, but I need an hour to go pray and seek the Lord. And so he comes back and God spoke to him and, and just gave him this peace. And when he came back, he was all chipper and all smiling. And and he's like, okay, God said that this is going to absolutely wow doctors, which actually happened. Mm. And he said, this is going to be so much easier than you think because God is in it with you. You're not doing this alone. Mm. And so we just began to both pray daily, God, renew my mind. Take these thoughts captive mm -hmm. um, because this, the same sex attraction was still there for him. Mm -hmm. The same sex attraction, even for me, although I was with him, I still was lustful towards women. Mm -hmm. You know, so we still had these things going on within um, our identities. And we were just, God, we were just like, Lord, um, renew our mind. Mm -hmm. And so we just kept praying like, God, if you renew my mind, this is going to be so much easier. Because mm -hmm. if you take the desire away, it's going to be so much easier to walk away from this sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So you guys have this moment of prayer. And, the, and 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 revelation, which is which is incredible. And then, how long from that moment to when you go, okay, and now I'm going to take practical steps mm -hmm. towards detransitioning. And what do those steps even look like? Yeah. So right when we got back um, from Indiana, I'm like, okay, I need to tell like my doctor at Planned Parenthood that I need to get off of testosterone because we're like right away, I need to obey the Lord within that. And so I made the appointment, I show up, and I actually was there for for just a regular, like, um, like female, like, checkup. And they had all these, like, medical equipment out for a biopsy. And I'm thinking, I did not sign up for this. So before I met my husband, I don't know if you know, but I had cancerous cells within my cervix. So I had to get them removed once a week. And my, Once a week? Yes. They're going inside yes, and I, removing cancerous cells once a week. How long did that go? Mm -hmm. That was, I think, uh, the first month within my husband and I's relationship. And oh. it was to the point where, so I was in Big Bear driving all the way down to San Bernardino once a week. And the procedure, you have to have someone to drive you up and down the mountain because it's yeah. it's painful. Right. Um, and so my, my father would drive me up and down the mountain. They kept telling me, we have to remove your, your cervix. Because of the years of testosterone, trans guys have to get their cervix removed because it's no longer functioning. It's be, be, basically because, becoming barren because of the testosterone. Because of the testosterone. Yes. And then is the cancer just random or is the cancer connected to the I testosterone? I fully believe that it's connected. You think it's connected? Absolutely. Is there any studies to support that yet? I full, I'm sure there is out yeah. there. But of course, you're going to see things removed off the internet mm. to continue the narrative. Um, but it makes sense that 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 would make sense because so many, every trans guy that I've ever known, even YouTube off in person, has had to get their cervix removed because if you don't have a period for years, your cervix is barren. Nothing's nothing's going on there. Yeah. Hmm. So with me, I had a lot of pain that hmm. I was experiencing and they were telling me, you have to get your cervix removed. Like, we need to remove this from your body. It's becoming toxic. There's cancer in it. And before Nick and I got married, he's like, no, tell them we're going to pray about it for a year. Mm. And so we prayed for a year and I just let it go. I didn't even want to go back. I didn't want to know if I had cancer. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So when I went for my annual checkup to also tell them I'm getting off of testosterone, she kind of swindled me. And I'm like, I didn't sign up for a biopsy. I'm just here for a regular pap. And the doctor's like, look, I'm already going to be in there. Let me just look in there. And basically, if we see it, we need to take next next steps. Next steps probably being we need to take a yes. step out. Wow. Yes. And I really didn't want to do that because, again, like I've never loved a man before. Yeah. The thought of kids was definitely something starting to be on my mind. Uh -huh. um, loving Nick enough to willing willingly to submit my body mm -hmm. 
in, in that sense. Yeah. And so that, she, you just said that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but you're right. it reminds me of first Corinthians seven, where mm. Paul is saying like, your bodies are not first Corinthians six mm. into seven, where he says, your bodies are not your own. Yeah. They're for the Lord. Right. Your temple of God. Mm. And so that you're having this full on like realization that like yeah. hey, your body is not your own and you don't get to do what you want anymore. Yeah. So true. Wow. Okay. So, so what, so what happens next year? They're saying we might have to remove mm -hmm. the cervix. So she looks in, mm -hmm. she pushes the table away. I'm in a vulnerable position. My legs are in there. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know how this is physically possible, but there's no sign of mm -hmm. any cancer or cells in your body anymore. Like your cervix looks literally brand new. She's an atheist. And this is before you even get off testosterone? Am this I is before correctly? I get off testosterone. So there's restoration, mm -hmm. there's physical healing. Like that. Wow. So <laughs> so when God said that he was going to renew my mind, he didn't just mean my mind, he meant my whole physical body. Because everything was completely renewed. Wow. And I told her, I said, I'm also here to let you know that I'm getting off of testosterone. And she's like, you can't just cold turkey get off of it. They're worried about suicide attempts mm -hmm. and mental health because the hormones have a lot to do with your brain mm -hmm. and depression and anxiety and such. And I just like kind of listened. But as we went up the mountain, you know, uh, and, and uh, now fast forward, I'm sorry, we're in Tennessee now. Um, I'm having a moment of prayer, my husband's showering, and the Lord just tells me in this moment of prayer, you don't need it anymore. Mm. This was after the doctor told me like, no, you need to stay on it. We need to slowly wean your body off of it. My body was used to this for so seven you, years. So did you go on taking it for a little bit after that? that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, for and like then a when week. you're in Tennessee is when you get the whole yeah. like... So was, I was maybe weaning myself off of it for a week. Okay. So as I'm in prayer, the Lord's like, no, you don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because I was thinking about, you know, what the doctor said. But I'm like, he's the great physician. Come on. So if he says that I don't need it anymore, I'm going to obey that. Come on. I go into the bathroom. My husband's like, the Lord just spoke to me. I'm like, okay, this is weird. Because I'm, I'm crying, like yeah. telling him, like, I'm just going to get off of this. Yeah. And he's like, the Lord said that you don't need it anymore. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, the Lord just confirmed that through my husband. And I'm like, I was coming in here to tell you that God told me I don't need it. Mm. And so from that moment forward, I never took a testosterone injection again. Wow. Okay. And it wowed doctors as well because yeah. I was totally fine. And then I got pregnant three months later with our miracle baby. Wow. You got, yes. you got pregnant three months after not being on testosterone in with a cervix that at one point you said they did find cancerous cells in yes. that all of a sudden was restored. Mm -hmm. And the doctors are just taken aback in terms of how this is even possible. possible. Yeah. Wow. And had you listened to them, it's, it's, it, you, you could have potentially had your cervix removed. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Very okay. grateful. I never did that. Yeah. And, um, what, what was, what was it like then seeing like the actual fruit of all of this in terms of conceiving a child? Oh, I was bawling my eyes out. Like e even from the moment of hearing that God fully restored me, mm. I was bawling my eyes out. And the doctor's like, this doesn't make sense. She just kept saying that because she's never seen anything like that happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he doesn't have to make sense. Mm. And man, John 10, 10, the enemy has come to steal, kill mm -hmm. and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life to the full. Mm -hmm. When we were identifying as that, were we living a fun, exciting life? Yeah, we were traveling. Things were great. But the life that I'm living now, like I feel like my life has just started mm -hmm. truly because I'm living in the fullness of, of what God has for us in his will. And like when I gave birth to Iris, it was just this beautiful blessing of a miracle that I never knew that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I never imagined being a mom. Mm -hmm. I have a video that I stitched in on my Instagram of me being like 15 saying like, I can never imagine myself being a wife or being a mom. <laughs> and mm -hmm. here I am, mm -hmm. you know, so beyond blessed to have that miracle baby. And so Iris, Iris's name, we af actually named her after the song um, Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls because mm -hmm. my husband and I are like old school. We like to slow dance and stuff. We had no idea that in Hebrew, Iris actually means God's promise, wow. the rainbow. Wow. Our testimony is talking about taking back the true meaning of the rainbow. Come on. Yeah. That's incredible. And now, I don't know if you if we can officially yeah, go for say it, it here. Yeah. You're pregnant with baby number two. Yes. And we found out she's a girl, another girl. Congratulations. Thank you. And her name is going to be Violet. So Iris, Iris and, and Violet. Violet. So cute. Yeah. Okay. And what's what's life like now on the other side of all of this? Because clearly, you know, it, it, it wasn't always simple and easy. Mm -hmm. Clearly there was a lot of wrestling you guys did with the Lord. Yes. And now your parents and you're living this like like did you 
Did you imagine that you would have the life that you have no. now? No. <laughs> Talk about that. No. There's been moments where my husband and I, we literally just cry. Mm-hmm. Like, and we're so grateful for our yes. Because I think it's so important to notate that when I was in that hotel room, although I was w- walking with the Lord, you know, in my 20s, started walking with him when I was 17 again, I still obeyed when I didn't agree. Mm. Because I, again, I, I believe that lie that like God made me this way and it was all good. Um, and I think no matter what, like the Lord loves us, but he wants what's best for us. Mm-hmm. And I just obeyed God when I didn't agree. And I think that's so important to say, like my husband chose to be with me Mm -hmm. as his wife Mm -hmm. at a time that he probably didn't agree either Mm -hmm. because he desired a husband. Um, And our life now is so much better than it it ever was before. Our marriage is so much better. Intimacy is so much better. Like every area of our marriage has been so doubled down on the blessing Mm -hmm. because of our yes. Mm. Yeah, and we're walking in the fruit of that with everything that we're we're experiencing in our life and our marriage and our family growing. Like children are a gift from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And to see how quick we're conceiving, I'm like, <laughs> okay. My husband's like, how many do we have? And I'm like, however however many the Lord wants wow. to give us. So <laughs> that's amazing. Um yeah. what is the desires, right? You mentioned that some people talk about their desires changing. Mm-hmm. Other people say their desires didn't change, mm-hmm. right? Um, I just had Brenda Blaine on. Brenda Blaine uh, was, uh, is some same-sex attracted, uh, but God put a man in her life that she totally loves and is attracted to. Yeah. But there's still some of that uh, same-sex attraction for lack of purpose, mm-hmm. r- lack of words. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, though she's in a heterosexual marriage, she loves her husband, has a family, same thing. Um and so there are some people that would say the desires didn't necessarily just magically go away. Yeah. But in your case, would you say that their the desires completely vanished? Like like walk me through, through yeah. that. It's a daily act of surrender. Okay. You know, truly a daily act of surrender. And I think like some people, if they see our Instagram or, you know, our ministry stuff, they think that it just happened overnight. Mm -hmm. But it was daily of us like praying like, God, please take this thought. And Mm -hmm. when I say that, it's the same sex attraction thought. It's the desire to continue to live in the security of Austin. Mm -hmm. You know, all the things within that. And I was just laying it down at the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And over time, after praying for the renewing of my mind and my husband as well, we realized that the desire was like fully gone. Really? Over time. Yeah, but yeah. it was it was a journey of inviting Jesus into it daily. Uh-huh. So I would say the only quote-unquote temptation mm-hmm. that uh, I've ever faced has been when the enemy's coming after me in my dreams. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been dreams that I'll walk into and I'll open a door and it's two girls. Mm-hmm. And even in my dream, I'm like, that's not me anymore. Mm-hmm. That's not who I am anymore. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that's the only temptation that I face is mm-hmm. like whenever the enemy is trying to torment me in my dreams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine ever being with a woman again. Like I'm so in love. I'm so attracted to my husband more than I've ever been attracted to a woman in my life. Mm -hmm. Never thought, (laughs) never, never did I ever think I'd even say that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's better than anything that I've ever experienced. And my husband's the the same way. Mm -hmm. So for our case, um, God fully renewed our mind, fully restored our marriage in areas we had no idea. Like our marriage bed was no longer defiled. Mm -hmm. There's this double down of a blessing on our intimacy. As you could see, I'm pregnant again, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's just, um, so much blessings within our yes. Was there more temptation prior for you prior th- to the detransition? I would say yes. Attraction to women prior to when you detransition. We have to think too. Testosterone, mm. hormones cause you to be attracted to the different sex. You, they've actually had studies. You could research this that when women get off of um, uh, birth control, uh-huh. they are naturally more attracted to a masculine man. When they're on birth control, they're naturally more attracted to more feminine men. Interesting. Hormones have a lot to do with our attraction. Yeah, yeah. And then think about all the hormones in our food, et cetera. Mm-hmm. We can go into that on another day. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's just crazy how much hormones can actually affect our attraction. Mm. So I, I could say 100% that I was still very lustful, still attracted, still um, in ways desiring women mm-hmm. at certain moments, um, even when my husband and I were identifying as a gay couple. Mm. Yeah. And would you say y- your husband, Nick, also? Would be attracted to men. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it was and, until and, the hotel room yeah. that, and, that it was gone. And then it's it, it went away. Mm-hmm. Wow. Interesting. And so now you guys are, I mean, God's using you guys in incredible ways. Yeah. But I think the, the thing that, the takeaway that I have is how do we treat people mm. that are perhaps actively in sin? Yeah. Perhaps they're 
it, when you guys were a gay couple for all intents and purposes, you you had a biologically male female marriage, but the ideology and your identity and your mm -hmm. expression wasn't that right. Yeah. And so so you have people that are actively in sin, and you have people who are um, ideologically misaligned with the scriptures, right? In terms of worldview. Yeah. And and how, and the practical side of how can the church come alongside of them, love them mm -hmm. well, but love them to not let and tell them not to stay who they are. That God loves you enough to, yeah. to change you, right? And it sounds like that's from what I'm gathering, like that's some of how God is using you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Is 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 grace and truth. Yes. You know. So I guess my question for you is, well, one, I guess do you acknowledge that from my vantage mm -hmm. point? And then two, what advice would you have for Christians in the church? in terms of how to better engage the LGBTQ yeah. community. Number one, don't gatekeep Jesus. Mm. We're all in need of a savior, whether if it's gender, sexuality, addiction, what, what pride, mm -hmm. you know, could literally be even making like your social media a, an, an idol. We're all struggling with something. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing that I would say is never forget when you were once lost. Mm. That's good. I think about that often. I think about... The decisions that I made as Austin, the addiction, the porn, the um, there was a moment that I prostituted myself, you mm. know, um, there's moments where I was addicted to cocaine and just doing crazy things. And I don't even really talk about that other than this platform right now. Mm -hmm. But I have to remind myself of that moment when I was looking for the world to fulfill that void. And then my moment of coming to Jesus and realizing that he can only fill that void. Mm -hmm. It's important to notate that God doesn't let us forget our sin, not because he wants us to feel shame or anything like that, but we have to be reminded what he brought us out of. Mm -hmm. And so as we're ministering to people, as we're loving people, we almost have to be ministering to ourselves. That's good. Because if we're not walking it out, then how can we, you know, ask God to use us yeah. to be vessels, to bring him glory? You mentioned cocaine. You mentioned uh, prostitution. You mentioned um, engaging with the community. You've also said that in your interactions with that that community, and I don't know if it was specifically uh, gay, lesbian, or specifically trans people, but that you did find a strong correlation from yes. ane anecdotally of people who have experienced essay mm -hmm. of people who have been sinned against yep. as children, and then these sorts of patterns start. Before we even imagined, like we never even imagined our life to be like this, we already noticed that within people within our friend group or people we'd meet at gay bars or at gay clubs or whatever, we all had this trauma mm. that we went through at a very young age. What percentage would you say folks from the LGBTQ community? Every have? person that Every we've, person you we've, ever, we've ever personally met okay. has had some type Something. of sexual trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And in your life, would you say the, 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 the trauma is down the road when you ended up mm -hmm. hard drugs, prostitution and, and, and ending up in that place, would you say that was a correlation to the sin that was caused against you when you Absolutely. were a child? Absolutely, because children are so vulnerable. They're so malleable. And like the enemies after our kids, we see it mm -hmm. everywhere nowadays, you know? Um, and so I really feel like if none of that happened to me, maybe I would have never struggled with all the things that I struggled with. Maybe I would have never walked down the path of the things that I walked down. Mm -hmm. Um but I don't think that it's a coincidence and almost all of us have experienced that. Mm. In your life, you had a, a parent who was also an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. My yeah. mother was an alcoholic. I'm sorry. And you you don't really know how um like how some how far some how far someone is gone. Yeah. Until you you they get sober and you get like a mm -hmm. normal version of or whatever normal is at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, talk about how that contributed to some of the shame and confusion that that you felt yeah. growing up. My mom would say things to me like, "Like finally, when I was like, okay, I, I need to start talking about this. I can't withhold this in me any longer." When I would tell her about you know my gender identity and my sexuality and only being comfortable with women etc i'm like i have to tell her about the sexual trauma that i went through like i need to release myself from this and i'll never forget like as i'm finally admitting this to her i'm in high school so you're a teenager yeah, yeah i'm a teenager so i'm like this is really vulnerable this is like around the time that i attempted suicide multiple times she's pouring her a glass of wine i say it out of my mouth mm -hmm. this happened at this day at this time he told me if i ever told anyone that he would kill my whole family I was raped. 
And my mom poured a glass of wine, put the bottle down, looked at me and laughed. She was drunk. So I, I don't credit my mom for saying this. I know now in the spiritual realm, they call it spirits for a reason. Yeah, yeah. It was demonic. It yeah. was a demon that yeah. knew the plan that God had for my life that mm. was trying to destroy me and mm. get me to kill myself. She poured a glass of wine and she said, that's why you're a freak. Mm. And that was just the beginning of the many things that my mother said when she was drunk and uh, other things that she was, she would grab my wrist and tell me exactly how she wanted me to kill, kill myself. She would throw my hand down and, and throw water at me and just like literally abuse me and tell me, just kill yourself already. You're already going to go to hell. You're such an abomination to this family. Um, And I started believing that lie. But again, like I just rededicated my life to Jesus. I'm Mm -hmm. going to church where I'm hearing that like Jesus loves me. And then my mom, the woman who brought me into this world is telling me that I just, God wants me to kill myself because I'm going to hell anyway. Mm. And I mean, the worst thing that that I, and I always hate saying this because it it still hurts me. Um, I've forgiven my mom. Thank God for the years of her sobriety and, you know, God restoring her and the testimony within that. But the worst thing she ever said to me was that if she, if she would have known that I was her daughter or going to be her child, that she would have aborted me. Mm. And one and thing she that said I, this to you as someone that identified as a Christian. Yes. Wow. And so not only was I experiencing this rejection from my family, from my perfect Christian family, mm. but I also was experiencing this rejection from all Christians. Mm. Because even when I had my own freedom and I had my own, my own car, or I could walk places, I would go to church and get called out in the middle of church. And say that I wasn't allowed to be there. I was hungry. I was desperate for Jesus. Mm. And so my husband and I have just devoted our life to making sure that we could equip the body of Christ yeah. to handle this. That is so that's so sad because this isn't that long ago. No. Right? Like when you say this sort of stuff, I think like in my mind, I go like, oh yeah, like this is what it was like in the 90s. Yeah, I know. Or in the I, 2000s. This is like less than a decade ago that you're experiencing this stuff. And I couldn't imagine as someone that's been active in church uh, for, 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 for 20 years, I couldn't imagine someone treating anyone this yeah. way, you know? So that's, so that's brutal in, in that your mom and your dad both identified as Christian. Yes. Uh, they split mm-hmm. and you much like many people are then pinned against your dad. Yes. And your dad is the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Your dad is terrible. This is this false narrative. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, I experienced the same thing. And, my and, dad was my rock too. And yeah. he was wonderful. I have many yeah. great things to say about him. Yeah. I, my, my mom did the same thing. And again, my mom is sober now. She's doing much better. Like, praise God. She like texts me photos of her at the gym now. And, like, <laughs> she has like a, like a, she has like a life. Like she has like friends. Yeah. It's, so, it's just so sweet. And, uh, but it was the same thing. And, and I think what was happening was she was trying to cover up her own brokenness mm. and how messed up she was after her and my dad split. Wow. And so in her pr- really projecting, like she had me thinking some crazy things. She had mm. me thinking that like my stepmom was a witch that casted a spell on oh, my wow. dad, like all kinds of crazy. So wow. I grew, up until I was like an adult, like I grew up believing mm-hmm. these sorts of things. And then, you know, my dad remarries, has a brother. Uh, I have a um, a brother and two sisters. So like now I'm kind of looking at them side eyed, you know, and it, yeah. it was it was really rough. And then I again, I didn't realize this until I grew up and until I had the courage to confront my dad about like what yeah. happened. And he, he would never say anything disparaging about my mom. He would never speak negatively about her. Wow. And so then as an adult, I asked him and then he said, he was like, okay, like, like, where were you? What happened? Why weren't you mm-hmm. around? And when he explained it all to me, then it was like, oh, like it makes sense. Like it all clicked yeah. that like, no, 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 he's not the super villain of the story. Mm-hmm. Like she, in her brokenness and in her mistakes and in her kind of, you know, driving to marriage, in, into the ground, and my, da- my dad yeah. probably contributed to some degree um, that she was projecting that on him when really she was an alcoholic and really struggling and just trying to hold it together, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it sounds like your your story was was similar. My mom admitted that she did admit. She that. did admit. Yeah, that. I don't think my mom got the got the uh, got the <laughs> humility to admit that. We're still working on her with the Lord. She came to church like Easter, but like I don't think she has the humility to like yeah. really admit that. She's not. She doesn't hate my dad as much. No. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your mom admits that. Yeah. So she admitted to a degree. Like she had, she very much was. Just, she would always say, "Why do you forgive me?" And I'm mm. like, "Because the Lord forgives you." And like the whole forgiveness story with my mom's insane. So at one point I was homeless, living in Marietta, out of my car. Is this around um, the same time you're doing hard drugs and, yeah, and, and prostitution? Yeah, just and being all that? stupid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doing the ways of the world. And and my mom was actually, um, I I got this wrong 
when I was on the Michael Knowles show, I said my mom was in prison. Correction, she was in jail. Okay. I didn't know the difference until my aunt <laughs> corrected me. Okay. Uh, but she was in jail for like hit and run and child abuse and all the things. And and which, wait, um, wait, which child abuse? Which child? For me. For you. Mm -hmm. She was in jail mm -hmm. for hit and run and abusing you. She, okay. The abuse, how do I explain that? She was in jail for the hit and runs. Uh -huh. The child abuse record, so because I was under, uh, seeing a therapist under Medicare, uh -huh. she pulled out a two pages front and back of every time the police were called to uh -huh. my house. Wow. Every time that they came for abuse. And she told me, when are we going to accept the fact that your mom abused you? Mm -hmm. um, so part of why she was in there, yes, was mm. because of the child abuse. But, and how old are you at this point? Uh, I'm 18, 19 okay. years old. With with all of this going on with my mom, anyway, so I, I, I'm in the car. I wake up, it's cold, and the Lord's like, Lord woke me out of my sleep and said, you're going to forgive your mom today. I start yelling at God in the car. Why would I forgive my mom? She's done this. She told me to kill myself. Like I had this suicide attempt. Why would I forgive my mom? I'm angry at my mom. I'm not really talking to my mom right now. I know that she's in jail, been ignoring all of her calls when she calls me, uh, barely even had money to have my phone bill on. And the Lord's like, no, you're going to forgive her. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, God. And uh, my mom calls me. The phone rings like not even five minutes later. No. She calls me from jail. Wow. And she's like, this is crazy, but God woke me out of my sleep this morning. And I have to tell you something. I'm like, God woke me out of my sleep. I have to tell you something. And she's like, God told me that he's taking away every desire that I've ever had to drink. And I'm like, that is so crazy because God told me that I need to forgive you this morning. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, again, another opportunity. This is before the hotel room story. Like, I'm like, okay, God, I don't agree, but I'm going to choose to obey you because I know you. And I chose to obey God. And I'm so glad because I had two years of a sober mom. And within that sobriety, she admitted, she's like, all those horrible things that I said to you, I was saying, because if your mom said it to you, I, I was just thinking like, if I said it, then it would hurt so much that you would force yourself to be straight that you would force yourself to be a woman and you wouldn't go down this path that I knew that people were going to bully you and, and hate you and you know all this persecution was going to happen and I'm like mom that still doesn't make sense and she like repented and like fully apologized but she did explain why you know she had that mindset um and I forgave her but she never really forgave herself mm. I would say up until the point that she even died like mm. she would just be like why do you forgive me I'm like because God forgives you mm. We have to think that forgiveness isn't just for us. Mm. I'm sorry, forgiveness isn't for the other person. It's for ourselves. That's right, that's right. And so like when I forgave my mom, it released me mm -hmm. from the trauma. It released me from the pain. It released me from the resentment that I had towards her. And it made more space for God to move in my life. Um, so I often think, you know, the level that we forgive, we we also will be forgiven. Amen. You know, the level that we bless, et cetera. So. Amen. And so your mom has two years of sobriety mm -hmm. um but you said she never forgave herself yeah and so she ended up passing away how long ago was that um two years sober then she died I, I can't remember off the top of my head the year that she died but actually that's how i found church lv because i was driving to and from las vegas with my husband and i lived there uh -huh. um to come to riverside community hospital because my mom just got sick mm. like she literally like just got sick Next thing you know, she's in the hospital. They're intubating her. Mm. Like, she's lost consciousness. Like, all this crazy stuff. Then she was on hospice and, like, took her off life support. It was a crazy thing. And, like, that's actually the book that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So she died in the room called Room 5229. Mm -hmm. And God just did so many miracles in that room. Probably one of the most supernatural encounters I've ever had with the Lord was in that room. And after that whole experience happened, God told me, you're going to write a book about what I've done in this room and you're going to call it Room 5229. Mm. And so it's actually going to be a book about my testimony, my mom's testimony, what God did in that hospital room. In, in terms of re restoration? Yes. Your guys' yes. relationship? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And so um, that had to have been hard to, 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 to like finally get your mom sober, mm -hmm. forgive her, and then you lose her. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but I lost my siblings. I lost my siblings throughout the years because my stepdad would identify as a Christian, but his Bible was dusted, never saw him lead the family in a spiritual matter, you know, um, would laugh at me anytime I had Bibles laid out as a preteen, you know, really struggling with this. And he too was very hateful towards me. And so when my mom got a divorce with him for her second marriage as well, he was just like, I don't want you to have anything to do with your sisters. Mm -hmm. And so it was my stepsister which was, you know, his daughter. Mm -hmm. And then my half-sister, which was um, 
you know, between my stepdad and my mom. Mm. And so I didn't get to see them for 10 years. The trauma mm. was so bad that my brother that's older than me didn't even want to talk to anyone in the family for 10 years, still has difficulty talking to us because he doesn't want any reminder of the trauma. Mm. So whenever we talk and, you know, my husband and I get the privilege of giving glory to God and we talk about the hardships, we're really just giving breadcrumbs of what we went through because it was difficult. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man, that that sounds... That sounds rough. And so are you are you in a better place with your siblings now? No. No. I wish I could lie and tell yeah. you, you know, say say yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I I talked to one of one of my mentors and um and so her husband has a psychology degree. Mm -hmm. And so she said that well, he said that when someone who's experienced any type of like trauma within family and stuff, and that person reveals it, there's always gonna be rejection from the other family members mm. because it's supposed to be hush. Oh, you're bringing shame on the family. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're bringing, you know, you're speaking ill of the dead. And unfortunately my siblings aren't saved. Mm -hmm. So they view it as like, you're, you're just talking crap on mom mm -hmm. and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, like there's a test before there's a testimony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm giving God glory for the fact that my mom was an alcoholic and he set her free and mm -hmm. there's been forgiveness and redemption, but there was also forgiveness and redemption in my story as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's all about perspective. So unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could say that we're closer, but yeah. they don't like the fact that I'm telling the truth yeah. instead of just covering it. Yeah. I mean, I think I think siblings are interesting and I think in time I believe God will restore that. I'm as praying well. for that. Yeah, I think yeah. I think he's already restored so much and I think in time like that'll that'll be restored and and, and you'll be in a much better place with them, you know? W what's next for you, Lex? You're, you're writing a book. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you're doing more speaking stuff. People can book you. Pastors can book you guys yes. for a conversation on, on some of this. T tell us what's next and how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, we're speaking in Hawaii next, oh, which is so cool. That's awesome. So, so cool. Um, and and we're just traveling and, and sharing the good news of Jesus. Uh, part of what we are saving for right now with our ministry is when I was 17, when I was born again, we had a Monday night prayer, and the Lord gave me this vision that I was going to buy a 40-foot school bus, travel out of it, live out of it, and mm. share the love of Jesus while mm. serving coffee. I knew nothing about coffee, <laughs> know nothing about driving a bus. <laughs> and this is before van life or schooly life was yeah, a thing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I even have the prayer journal, the date, the time, everything. Yeah. Uh, and I told my dad, I'm like, God told me that I'm, he gave me this vision for my life. And yep. I met my husband and he was working on a coffee farm in Kauai. He's worked in coffee his whole life. Mm. And so he's he's the coffee, he's the musician part of everything. And so right now we're saving up for a 40-foot school bus awesome. to convert and travel into a tiny house coffee ministry. Our ministry's name is Revive Traveling Ministry. Uh -huh. And we're just called to love the misfit community. We That's believe awesome. that everyone has a sense of belonging, that they deserve an encounter with God, yeah. and that we get to equip the body of Christ with how to love this community better. So just one cup of coffee at a time. We're going to share the love of Jesus for free. You know, just give yeah. them free coffee. Yeah. Be hospitable. We're going to go to places like Venice Beach, Coachella, you know, places where people wouldn't think that they would have an encounter with yeah. God. Yeah. And let God do what he does best. Yeah. So. How can they get more information on that and possibly support yeah. that? So you could follow us on Instagram on Revive Traveling Ministry, and we have a link in our bio to give, to partner with us, um, links to different interviews, like how to get in touch with us personally to come out to speak to churches. Um, and yeah, that's how you could support us that way. Awesome. This was so fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, Maybe next you. time we could have you and your husband back. Yes. That would be great. Um, and yeah, this was great, guys. Check out Lex. All right, guys, we're going to go over to our Patreon exclusive segment with my friend Lex. Uh, we're just going to talk about some stuff that's probably a little too spicy for YouTube. Perhaps it's a little more personal. Um, so if you want to sign up for a free seven-day trial, meet us over there. You'll see the entire conversation unedited as well as the extended version on Patreon and get access to our future conversations as they're streaming live on Patreon, access to our guests, all that kind of good stuff. Here's a little preview of what you can expect in a Patreon-only segment. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace. They had like black market underground people that were down there paying money to get children sex change surgeries. Tell me what your opinion is on pronoun hospitality. You, you mentioned that oftentimes the Christian community uh -huh. doesn't know what to do with you. Oftentimes yeah. the Christian community. She would make fun of me, call me a Jesus freak, all this stuff. She OD'd, died on the table when God brought her back to life. Like she knew where she was gonna go. Something recently that kind of took the, the world by storm was the Olympics. Yes. And the Bruce Lawn.